an interview with Mitch Joe, author, entrepreneur, and master of the digital media. Coming right up. Bonjour, and welcome to the Minter Dialogue radio show. I am Minter Dial, the host of this downloadable radio show, also known as a podcast. I'm the author of TheMindset.com, that's with a Y, T-H-E-M-Y-N-D-S-E-T, blog where you'll find the show notes for this interview, and I also write en français on MinterDial.fr. Moving quickly to the interview, which I'm very excited to bring to you, it is with, with Mitch Joel who in 2008 was named Canada's most influential male in social media, one of the top 100 online marketers in the world. He's a passionate entrepreneur, president of the Twist Image Digital Media and Communications Company, which was the only digital agency to be named one of the top 10 agencies in Canada. He's also the author of Six Pixels of Separation, a book published in 2009, that exposes the great value of our networks with great concrete examples, how to leverage your connectivity, and which I completely recommend. Mitch is also author of the prolific Six Pixels of Separation blog, a, also of a podcast that has some 230 different episodes which you can enjoy, and is frequently published in many of the headline media, such as the Huffington Post, Business Week, Global Mail, just amongst others. Now let's cut straight to the interview. Well, welcome to the Minter Dialogue show. This is the first show that will be in English. And I have a distinct pleasure to have a, uh, I would say, a guru in the domain and a friend, Mitch Joel online, straight from Montreal, Canada. Mitch, how are you doing? I'm good. Really? I'm great. How are you? Uh, excellent. I'd love to hear about, a little bit more about Twist Image and uh, how is, how's business? What have you been focusing on recently? Business has been great. You know, we the company started in 2000, and I joined um, my two business partners. We're now, we're now four business partners in around 2002, and I think at that point it was one of those agencies where you know we had one employee and a couple little projects, and this whole thing was you know let's try and see how far we can push this whole marketing thing and. I think we quickly sort of defined that we wanted to really focus on the digital space. And for us, that's obviously, you know, web and mobile and stuff like that. And, you know, we've had a really good trajectory. We brought in a CEO, uh, Mark Goodman, who is the founder in Canada of FCB Direct, which is one of the largest uh, direct marketing agencies. Now it's part of Draft FCB when they've gone through all that that sort of stuff. After 20 plus years of being there and building that from from a zero staff to, to where that was, which was a, a really big a big shop, he was uh, he took his, his year off and then, and then decided to join us. And I think that was also a sort of big catalyst for us in terms of really growing and pushing the team. And it's been amazing, you know. We're now with uh, about 130 employees over two offices in in both Montreal and uh, Toronto, and the, the projects have been great. We've moved, to, we've tried to move away from from being sort of just project focused and working more on agency of record type accounts where. You know, big, semi-big brands come to us and say, "Listen, this is what we're looking to spend digitally uh, for the next year." And help me plan it, help me do it, and then help me spend it. And, and we, we like those clients; those are really good clients for us. And it's been uh, it's it's been really really good for sure. We work with clients like uh, the Dairy Farmers of Canada, Telus, which is one of the largest wireless communication carriers here. Um, TD is a big financial institution bank in North America. Uh, we do work with Microsoft. We do work with a whole bunch of other really dynamic brands. So most of your business is North American, and you have clients in the states as well as in Canada. Yeah, you know, I think the web is ultimately global, and so I think the stuff we, we, we do has this sort of global thing going on to it, but primarily the clients in terms of where their head offices are are based either in Canada or the U.S. All right, so I know you, you do some speaking engagements at the very least over in Europe. You were in London last week. Um, I was. Right? Missed you, sorry. Um, if you had to compare North American and European companies as, the, as regards – their development towards digital marketing strategies. How would you do qualify that difference? Well, I think we sit in a really unique space, or at least I think I do, and I think you do too, because you, you, you've lived in this part of the world. Like, you know, Canada is is part of North America, but depending on where you are, it's not very North American. And I think, you know, especially living in Montreal and being born and raised here and spending my life here, it's probably the most European city in maybe Quebec City too but but you know the area province of Quebec for sure in in North America and I think it does give give me a very different perspective I sort of chalk it up you know when I think about 
U.S., I think about their tremendous risk takers and they're highly entrepreneurial. And then as you move north of the border to Canada, I find that we are way less risk. Uh, we are very, very risk averse. You know, we're not not as interested in doing that. Um, you know, much more sort of fast followers. What would be sort of a way to look at it? Uh, that doesn't mean there's not a lot of innovation. There's not a lot of entrepreneurship. Of course, there is. It's just at the level, and it's not as culturally sort of ingrained as it is in the US. My experience with Europe has been really, you know, even more dramatic in terms of how Canada looks to the US, which is very traditional um you know, hierarchical, very set in, in their ways. Uh, I don't want to say old because it's, it's not. You know, although it's the old world, I don't think I don't think people's mindset there is old, but very traditional. And I just I think that that's a, it's a big challenge. I, you know, I spend a little bit of family in France, and so we were there quite often. I'm, I'm in the UK. I've been in Germany and, and Norway, places like that. I think there are people just like Canada who are highly entrepreneurial and, and have that entrepreneur spirit. I just think that the culturally. Both in Canada and Europe, it's a very hard thing to pull off. It's just it's not a culture that truly embraces entrepreneurship. I tend to, I tend to agree with you, and I think financially the financial structure doesn't allow for it so easily. It's definitely not ingrained in the culture anyway, as far as France is concerned. But then if you if I you know I'm t- I talk to a bunch of uh, heads of companies here, and I typically con- I would I would say um, agree that there's a, at least a a back a back lag there with regard to digital strategy. But since the U.S. and Canada are ahead of the game, I always try to think about how can they sort of catch up and learn from the mistakes made in North America in an attempt to catch up to where they could be. And I was wondering what you might think. What, what, what lessons would you think could be appropriate to give to heads of companies here to, to catch up? It's like the iPad syndrome. I, I, I have a friend who works for WPP, and they're involved in, in the brand and content division of that. And he jokingly says, you know, if you look at the worst U.S. airline uh, in terms of just, you know, what they have on board and stuff, whether, you know, you're looking at, you know, United or, or, or American, whatever, there's just, you know, and it's crazy. You fly in Canada, you fly in Air Canada, you've got, you know, monitors in the seat, you've got power outlets in every seat, not just talking about business class, clean, modern planes. And he goes, maybe these, these, these sort of less than airlines have it right, because now what they can do is just give everybody a $600 iPad for the flight and off they go. And so I think that's actually the best visualization you can say of, of, of Europe versus the U.S., which is if you wanted to catch up, now's a great time, right? Because suddenly the technology is very, very free and the access to information is a lot easier. You don't have to worry so much about the infrastructure that's either been built or hasn't worked. The challenge with that is, is I think it fundamentally comes down to a cultural decision. And I just, I, I believe it has to be ingrained in people. And because of the way cultures have developed traditionally in Europe, I think it's a long, hard task, meaning it's amazing to have these tools and this access and this activity right there at your fingertips but ultimately if you don't culturally believe in your heart of hearts that we're going to be a entrepreneurship driven first economy uh, that that's where it, it will all begin and you know begin to live and die and i see this even in, in our own day-to-day work which is dealing with brands and helping them understand whether it's just a social media component of it or why they should be focusing more on the digital it's a huge challenge that there's just it's it's culturally not ingrained in them. It's you know as my my friend Avinash Kaushik says, who's the analytics evangelist at Google, it's not in their blood. They just don't believe in their heart of hearts that this is that big, and it's it scares it scares me. I have to say, ultimately, it scares me. I read books like. You know, Wikinomics and Macroeconomics by Don Tapscott, or Here Comes Everybody by Clay Shirky, or Convergence Culture by Henry Jenkins. And it's what seems so obvious to me, you know, books written four or five years ago about these huge shifts. And we're not just talking about how people consume. We're talking about literally the physical infrastructure of, of our worlds. And and companies really have this attitude of, well, maybe it's just a fad, or, 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 or we still are doing great business here, there, or everywhere. And of course they are, and it doesn't mean you should stop doing what you're doing. It means that there's a new way to think. And so I think in a, in a long-winded way, the answer to your question is it has to be a cultural imperative from within, that, that the people within the society and communities make a decision that says, you know, if we keep going about things the way we're going about them, the world's going to pass us by. All right, so I understand what you're saying. You were saying that there's a, sort of a lack of an entrepreneurial spirit within as the culture is concerned. How, are, there, are there any other ways that you could define what's needed? I mean, like client-centric or more listening. What are the other types of skills that you think are needed 
to be injected into this culture that's sort of missing. Well, I, yeah, I, th- I think it, I think it's more of a uh, of a governmental chamber of commerce cooperative initiative that says we are going to invest heavily and give advantages, extreme advantages, to those who are looking to do things that have more virtual appeal, whether it's, again, creating co-working spaces or encouraging entrepreneurs to start up ideas or or creating a mentorship program or even creating a a retraining program where the more adventurous people, you know, know, bring, bring the top business leaders out to the web next week in Paris and have them sort of see and connect to these types of entrepreneurs and see what types of sparks can happen there. Those are the types of things that need to happen. But again, they're not, you know, you know, so you're not going to have a tactical sort of A, B, C, D. It has to be a, an imperative mm-hmm. that says, you know, what because the tactics become boring. It's a strategic imperative, right? It's like, why? Why should we do this? Like, you know, I've been okay running my factory and sending trucks out on the road for, for, for two centuries. Why, why care now? I, you know, like you said, I was in London the other week and I went over to the toy store. And, you know, I look on the sign and the toy store has been in business 250 years. You don't really see that here in North America. You know what I mean? And then you, you think to yourself like, wow, I, I work with businesses that have a hard time culturally changing after – 15 or 20 years of being successful in business. 250, good luck to you. <laughs> Welcome to Minter's world. Um, so if you, uh, I, would look, you know, I, I, I talk to these, uh, these folks and of course sometimes I, it's, it's a long conversation, I should cut it that way. I'm a little bit of an evangelist. Um, we we'll try to benchmark what is the right type of investment for certain industries. What, how do you uh, frame that conversation about where, where should you be in terms of digital investments? So uh, one of the, one of the areas that that I found the most interesting is avoiding the sort of general percentage and avoiding the ROI discussion. And I've I've lifted, stolen, grabbed the thought from Richard Binhammer, who is one of the sort of initial communications people at Dell, who really helped them forge their turnaround in terms of what they've done. And what what he told me in a conversation is that he prefers looking at business objectives and how to use the digital channels to beat the traditional way of using those objectives. And I find that that's actually been the best technique strategy to work with, which is you you sit down with a company and you go, what are your business objectives this year? The big ones, the small ones. And then the questions become, what do I have in my toolbox in these digital channels, the web, mobile, et cetera, that can help you get there? Will some of them help you get there faster, cheaper? Will some of them help you get there in a way in which when we go back to this next year, there'll be infrastructure, there'll be a semblance of a community or audience? I've found personally that in the past two to four years that taking that type of perspective has made the the businesses understand the value proposition all that much better versus saying, you know, listen, you should be, you know, you're 12% digital, you need to be at 15. I don't know that that's going to work. The challenge that we have with, with all of this stuff, whether you're looking at ROI, whether you're looking at business objectives, or whether you're looking at overall percentages of what the spend is, is the talent pool. And so you might have a very excitable company in, in France that's totally excited to do this, and they push forward with a multi-million dollar initiative, and yet you're going to struggle to find the people to actually do the execution on that. And so we're placed in a very interesting, is a fun word to use, <laughs> uh, dichotomy here, which is that when you have a brand pushing, you know, we had this in Canada where Procter & Gamble decided to use Canada as a test market. They said they would be shifting their numbers up to 25% digital. And I laughed because one is they wouldn't be enough inventory for them to buy. They could buy every single piece of inventory for that. And then two, how are you even going to staff it to get this work done? It's not like there's you know thousands of professional digital marketing people who are out of work and looking for jobs. This is a very tough competitive market with a, a non-heavily experienced group of people delivering products. And so you know we're faced with a with a very, very big moment right now. And I, I, I sort of sum it up by calling it media purgatory. You know, you're not in heaven, you're not in hell, you're sort of stuck in the middle here. And I don't know which way it's going to swing, but we need, we need education at so many different levels and skill set improvements at so many different levels that we're never going to get to the point where we could even deliver when those numbers move. Yeah, so if you, if you say, Mitch, that um, you throw all your money into it, it's not really about a, a specific amount, it's about having the right objectives, you have to have the right talent pool, and then you also have to have the right culture on top of that to make it worthwhile. Yeah, and it, you know, so if you think about that and then you say, so Mitch, like, what's the difference between, you know, 
Europe and North America. It's like, I mean, you know, the challenges wind up being the same. It's essentially, you know, how are you going to culturally shift the organization to have a digital first mentality? How are you going to hire, train, and staff for that? And then how are you going to also spend the time on the education side, both internally and externally, working with clients and, and, and staff to really push the needle forward? Those are really big things. I mean, pe- people talk about the transition of traditional media, whether it's a newspaper or magazine, to the digital world. What they feel they'll to ultimately understand is it's it's not a different business. It's a completely other business. Hmm. It's not like you're saying to someone, well, it's like saying to someone, well, you sell socks and we want you to sell cars because, you know, you sell. It doesn't really work like that, you know. And I think that when you're when you're going from a physical world to a digital world and whether it's happening on on your products in the front end like it's happened to the music industry or books or movies or it's happening on the back end where we're talking about your customer relationship management software your ERP whatever it's happening with an industry you know B2B even it's B2C it's not it's not really no one's really exempt from this and so it becomes a very very complex thought for, for, for brands because what we're actually saying to do is, you know, uh, the name of my next book is Control, Alt, Delete. Uh-oh. And it literally is. It's, it's about reboot. Like it's not going to be good enough to just zig or zag or add this or do this. It's going to require the senior executives in an organization to sit down, senior, orga- senior people in the country, in a nation, in a province, in a state to sit down and say, we need to change. You know, the only thing that's going to save Detroit, the only thing that's going to save New Orleans at this point is, is not the levies and it's not the car business. It's going to be the heads of those places from government and education and business to sit down and say, what do we bring into this environment here that we can help these people better manage in a world that's becoming increasingly more digital? Do you believe in a protocol or a charter uh, with regard to digital marketing policy for the employees? I don't believe in, in a charter. Wow, it's a good word, charter. I, 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 th- I think a lot of people talk about p- policies. I, I like talking about guidelines. I think social is social because it's social, and it, it's very hard to tell a person, be this when you're at work, but when you leave work, make sure you're like that, and do that all in one place called Facebook, where most of your friends are, are, are you know, posting pictures of you drunk on the weekend. The, the challenge with that is we live in a world of, of tremendous transparency. We live in a world where many of us have resigned our privacy to be more engaged and connected in this hyper-connected world, and I don't see that as being bad or good. It's very agnostic. It's what the people do with it that matters. And so again, it comes back to my push towards education and also creating a semblance of guidelines. Most people, when they breach guidelines or when they breach even policies, they're actually not really breaching social media policies or digital policies. They're breaching their employment agreement, which mm-hmm. is much more dramatic. Indeed. <laughs> um, and, and people don't think about that, right? Most, most, most baseline employee agreements talk about confidentiality, what we do and we do not discuss outside of the the work environment and those are, are, are sort of the things where we're you know i find that uh, that we're really reminding people of here we have social media guidelines that you know talk about being a good online citizen being responsive making sure people within the organization outside of the organization understand if there's a complaint or understand if there's a, a testimonial of happiness but but Beyond that, what we're really telling people is please mind your, your, your employment agreement and please respect a couple of things. You know, we don't talk about client work publicly, whatever, you know, whatever those rules might be. Well, we just had a case uh, last week in Paris where a, a couple of uh, employees were found guilty uh, or were justly fired for speaking on their Facebook wall about their own boss in coming up after the, Chicago, uh, no, the Connecticut uh, woman who was fired and the NRLB is now into that case. So it's a pretty hot topic. So um, I just yeah, and like, like, what are the rules? Like, we all read this and we're like, why are you such an idiot? <laughs> if I, I've heard the story in the U.S. where there was a bank and the person um, took a picture of the safe and then put it on Facebook, like, this is where I work. Like, you know, trying to say, like, how, how cool is this? Yeah, it's very cool. You're an idiot. Uh, you know, you're really. And, and, and so I think it's instances like that where it's more better judgment than a technological imperative. Yeah, common sense still reigns. Um, so. Well, I know I've listened to a lot of your um, your podcasts with Joe, Joe and about um, digital media, social media. For is it fair to say that you consider um, Twist Image a digital media agency that is an umbrella for social media? 
Well, you know, I think that we're moving towards a world where where a lot of content and context in the digital channel has to be social. It has to be shareable, linkable, collaborative, whatever it might be. And so, you know, it's not surprising that that a lot of the work we do has social components to it. You know, the bulk of our, our work is still we're doing big builds. We're helping clients build big sites, big strategies, and a lot of them have social things. I, you know, for me, social does it. It falls as part of what we're trying to do to help people connect to brands. Ultimately, my, my goal at the end of the day, whatever channel I'm using, is to, is to help people connect to a brand. And, and connection can be something as simple as I just buy from you and I forget about you to I want to really hear from you and, and be connected to you in a much more intimate or, or, or private way. So you have clients that are coming to you and say, well, you know, I've got I've got my other agencies taking care of my television advertising, and you can take care of the rest, and and that stays. How how do you work with that? We work great with that. I, you know, we spend a lot of our days actually working with the other agencies, not directly with the clients, because you're right. Clients have multiple agencies for general advertising, for branding, for PR, whatever it might be. We handle the digital side, so we're one cog in a very very big wheel where we're helping the client better understand what it is. The big shift we're seeing here is obviously from the general running of the top line communications, a lot more of the responsibility has been falling into our laps, primarily because people's first brand interactions is, is happening more and more you know, online. Got it. All right, so I have a couple last questions for you, Mitch. Um, the first one, it's a, you know, my, one of my little sayings is uh, branding gets personal, so I always like to have a little a personal touch. Uh, and who would be for you uh, Mitch Joel, your personal mentors or inspiration uh, that you've had in your life? It's a, it's, it's a great question. There are some obvious ones. There are people like the writings of Seth Godin and Tom Peters who have really inspired me to think critically about business and appreciate that when I'm blogging, it doesn't have to be so academic that you can actually let loose and bring a lot of emotion into it. And I think that really, you know, when I think about that, there, those two guys have definitely created for me this sort of freedom to let go and do things. Um, you know, when it when it comes to thinking differently, I'm very intrigued by people like Malcolm Gladwell and Dan Ariely and. Um, the Freakonomic guys in terms of, you know, Dr. Robert Cialdini for influence. So there's, there's a couple of sort of key sort of not marketing thinkers that get me thinking. But the bulk load of it really comes from my peers. And my peers are people like you and Joseph Jaffe and Chris Brogan and Julian Smith and Hugh McGuire and Amber Naslin and you know, Avinash Kaushik. And I can go on and on or you can just read my blog roll yeah, I do. <laughs> to, to, or people who I'm linking to, you know, Sally Hogshead and Jeffrey Ginnimer. And like literally I can go on and on. I, I take so much uh, value from Reading, listening, following, and then obviously connecting um, in our protein forms to a lot of these people. That that that, and it's more what I've learned actually in, in this sort of fragmentation of media and blogging and podcasting is that the really good stuff isn't sort of relegated to the one or two top business booksellers anymore. It's more about being inspired by a couple little things here, a couple little things there, and how they all pull together for me. Thanks for that, Mitch. Um, so six pixels of separation was a great success. I certainly I loved it, and I talked about it a lot amongst my uh, my group over here. You've got Control Alt Delete coming out. When's that coming out? Oh, I don't know. I still have to get on a plane to New York and work with my agent on getting the proposal in front of my publisher. I suspect my publisher will be interested in that. If they're not, then we'll be pushing on to uh, finding another suitable publisher for it. But I'm, I'm confident we'll, we'll be working with the same publisher because I had a great time with them. You know, once once that happens, we'll, we'll probably be looking about you know seven to eight months after after that deal gets sort of done. So I'm a ways off, but it, but it, you know, again, it's. Uh, it's a balancing act, as everyone knows, between personal life and, mm-hmm. and work. And, you know, work for me has been great. We, like I said, we've had tremendous growth. We've had a 60, 50 to 60 percent growth year on year every year, and that includes through the recession. So someone, someone recently talked about it, it's like a 370 percent growth over the past couple of years, and it has been that, that big. The blogging, you know, the, the sort of journaling and, and writing and journalism part of it. So uh, it's, it's busy, but I'm actually exci- You know, it's coming to the point with me where I, you know, writing for me is very visceral. It's very raw, and it's very much my art, and it's my passion. And I can feel the book sort of 
brimming to the top. So it's, it, for me, it's just a matter of months before it explodes. Love it. It's very therapeutic for me. So uh, unless you're going to get in a plane and come to Paris, which, of course, I hope we do, how else can we find you if I, I want uh, my listeners to get in touch with you? Or read about the, the easy, yeah, the easiest place is www.twistimage.com forward slash blog. Uh, you can just search Google for Mitch Joel and no. find me everywhere. That's for sure. Your Twitter handle is? Mitch Joel. I'm That's Mitch Joel it. everywhere. <laughs> Very consistent. A man who, I, for me, who uh, I, I model after in terms of uh, managing his own image. And uh, I certainly love hanging out with you, Mitch, reading about you. Appreciate your time giving me this. And uh, look forward to continuing on with you. I'm ready when you are. Hey, Mitch, have a great one. Thanks a lot, okay? Thank you. Take care. In the arms of a woman I'm a convinced man Mid to the test so thanks for having listened to this recording of the Minter Dialogue radio show with Mitch Joel. You'll find the show notes on themindset.com, T-H-E-M-Y-N-D-S-E-T. And you can also sign up for my weekly newsletter. If you like this show and speak French, you can find my other French language interviews on minterdial.fr. In the meantime, please come and join the conversation at The Mindset. Branding gets personal. Or catch me on Twitter at mdial, M-D-I-A-L. In the meantime, have a great day. Ciao.